All right, before we begin the lecture, uh, a few words about the end of the semester. This is week 14, next week is week 15, and then we have finals week. Um, there will be no lecture next week, all right? Instead of a lecture next week, I'm going to have extended office hours. I will post about this uh, later on this week to explain uh, how they work. And I strongly encourage you to stop by and show me where you're at with your project. Um, there's no reason if you've done the work throughout the semester that you shouldn't get full points on the project. And one way that you can help yourself achieve that goal of getting a, a, a full score on the project is by showing it to me, because if there's any problems or any issues with it, then I can tell you right away, you know, hey, change this and you'll be in good shape. So please make a point to see me uh, during the office hours to review uh, your project. Um, it's not a requirement, but I strongly encourage you to do that. So this is the last lecture next week. Extended office hours, and the uh, next the week after that is finals week, and your project is due Wednesday that week. Also, everything that you have to turn in, like redoing assignments and everything you're going to turn into me, is due Wednesday on finals week. Uh, be on the lookout for a uh, announcement concerning this. I will post that sometime this week. So do pay attention to that. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty uh, flexible about deadlines throughout the semester, but come the end of the semester, uh, I have to uh, I have to have you toe the line a little bit, and I have to have you getting things on time and not turning things in after the final deadline. So I'll post information about that, and uh, so so take a look at that. All right. Anyhow. We were on JavaScript uh, where we left off last week. And JavaScript, remember, is something that the web server sends back to the client, client being some device that's running a web browser. It sends it along with the HTML and the CSS, and that sort of, uh, are the main things that constitute a web page. Yeah, there's images and other files and so on, but that's content, all right? The main three languages that comprise web pages are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. HTML is where the content of the web page lives. So if you have a link, that's content. If you have an image, that's content. If you have a video, that's content. And there are HTML tags for all of those things. Again, uh, we covered many of the most important tags in HTML, but there are others too, like if you want to put an audio file. There's a tag for that. Uh, everything about HTML is tags. So if you want to add content, content to your page, it's just a matter of what are the HTML tags for that. HTML also contains the logical organization. In other words, you group things together into sections. This is the header section. This is a nav section. Here's uh, a section of the page. Here's the footer and so on. So I call that the logical organization, that, that this content is grouped together as a unit. CSS is responsible for the appearance of the page, including the physical layout. So what font do we use? What colors do we use? How big is the font? How much space are there between items? All those things are aspects of the appearance and just about anything about the appearance of the content we can set through CSS. All right, uh, we also handle the physical layout. 
you know, in HTML, we have these sections of the page. The, the CSS tells the browser how to lay out that content on the page. Is the navigation along the top of the page or is the navigation along the left of the page, left side of the page, or the right side, or the bottom, or whatever? CSS is responsible for that physical layout along with the appearance. JavaScript is responsible for behavior. And interactivity. And what do we mean by that? We mean that the user typically, the user does something and the page responds by changing either something in the HTML or something in the CSS. Let's spend a minute to review the examples that we went over next, uh, last time and then come into some new examples. And I hope we see how these three things work together to make a completed web page. We had the spoiler example, right? And we can show the spoiler, show the spoiler, change the color. All right. So when the page first loads, it looks like this. There's HTML content for this. There's HTML content for this. The CSS says to make this green. The CSS says to make some of the content invisible. And as we click show spoiler, we can see that HTML content become visible. And we see that other HTML content become visible, or we can change uh, the color of that. So let's take a quick minute to look at and review that. Again, for simplicity, I put everything in the same file. You should have things separate as we've been doing throughout the class. Well, the HTML has a content, right? It has a question and it has the answer. Here's the question, here's the answer. Question, answer. CSS, there's not a lot of CSS uh, in here, but there's CSS to make the things that have a class of spoiler, specifically the paragraphs that have a class of spoiler, make those invisible initially. So uh, CSS is controlling the appearance of the content, including making some of the content invisible. And this is invisible as well. And finally, the thing that has an ID of question one, we give a background color of green two. So that sets the way the page looks initially. Through JavaScript, we can change that. So in this case, when we click the button, we click this button to show the spoiler. What it does is it says document get element by ID spoiler one. What that statement does is it finds the thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler one, because we're going to do something with that. Document means on this web page. Get element by ID spoiler one means find the thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler one. That's this paragraph. What are we going to change about it? We're going to change the style of it. And again, what's the style? The style is all the stuff that we have contained in here. These are the same attributes. We're going to change the display attribute. Well, here we set the display attribute to none for everything that had a class of spoiler. For this particular item, we're going to change the display to block, and that makes it visible. Notice a few things here. Notice that the capitalization matters. Notice that the quotes matter. There are double quotes that go around the whole JavaScript instruction. Within the quotes, there are single quotes that designate a specific value. So here we want something called spoiler exactly that value, that specific value. 
here we want to change it to the specific value of block. Not some variable or something named block, but that specific uh, item. And again, if you don't follow these rules, JavaScript is not very forgiving. HTML is pretty forgiving, you know? If you forget, for example, a end tag, a lot of times that doesn't matter. Your page will display just as you want it to display, all right? Or maybe it displays a little bit different, but it's still usable. Where in JavaScript, if you make a mistake, um, it doesn't work. So, for example, if we make the, this capital S instead of lowercase s, because JavaScript is case sensitive. Button doesn't work. We don't see the spoiler. Now, how do you debug this? All right. We try to gather as much evidence as we possibly can. How do we do that? We start off by looking in, if you're using Chrome, more tools, developer tools, and console. And this gives you some information that might not be really obvious, but after a while you get used to reading these. It says, you can't set property of undefined. Specifically, you can't set the display property of undefined. Hmm. What does that mean? That means that this, since we can't set the display property of undefined, it means that this is undefined. Now, how could that be undefined? Well, there could be a few possible reasons. One of the reasons is if there is uh, any typos in especially this. And in this case, we see that the style is capital S. Let's compare that to if this was a capital D. It's gonna give us a similar error, but it's gonna be subtly different. Ah. Get element by ID is not a function with a capital D. And then you should remember that. You don't put quotes around it, it's not going to work. It's going to think you mean a variable somewhere in your program. If you put double quotes in here and double quotes on the outside, it will also not work because the double quotes will make it think that it's the end of the JavaScript instruction. All right. I think we went over the other example in here. Yeah, we did. The difference between these two is mainly how the JavaScript gets triggered. If we go back to our little diagram here, how does this JavaScript get invoked based on events? That is, the user does something The user interacts with the HTML that creates events <laughs> that the JavaScript kicks in and does its thing. So in the last example, we use the on click event. If you notice that. Bring it up again to show you that. On click equals document, get open by ID. In this example, we use on mouse over. And we use on mouse out. We put our mouse on that paragraph. Uh, 
So it's the same thing as it did before. It finds the thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler one, changes its style, changes its display property, and it changes it to block. Now, if you move the, your mouse out of that, it does the reverse. It hides it again, changes the display property to none. So it's pretty much the same JavaScript code. However, however, is invoked by a different event. So put the mouse on, it appears, put the mouse out, it disappears. Funny thing is, is that paragraph, like all paragraphs do, extends the width of the page. So even if we put our mouse over it way over there, If we wanted to make it clearer, we could give these a width. I could do something like this, P. With. Make it 10% of the page. And let's give it a border. Now, we can see that if we put our mouse over that, that that's the target. Whereas if we put our mouse over there, it no longer works because the paragraph is only this wide. All right. Those are the two examples we had over last time. We might have started a third. Let's look in here. Save that one. Let's look at menu one. Menu one is an example of a simplified example, but an example of the basic uh, JavaScript menus. Like I mentioned on ESPN. How do I know this is done in JavaScript? Because the change is immediate. I put my mouse on that immediately that displays without any flickering of the screen. So all they're doing is when the mouse is over this, it makes this sub menu appear using probably the exact same techniques we did. Uh, the code probably has more complexity to it than that, but fundamentally it's doing the exact same thing. So let's look at this example. As I put my mouse, I only did this for the first one. As I put my mouse over this item, the sub menu appears. All right. What am I doing? Kind of the same thing. I'm mouse over, get element by ID sub item, change the style to block. So we just make this little sub menu appear. How do we make that disappear? And I think we went over this last time, but it won't hurt to review it. We can put an on mouse out. and change it back to none. And I think last time we saw the problem with this. Problem with this is as we put our mouse over here, as we move down to click one of those items, we've taken our mouse off of that and it disappears. 
So we have to do the exact same thing to the unordered list. Now, if we do it, we can go down and click those things. Let's see what menu two is. Oh, menu two. Is similar to menu one, except we can make the menus appear and disappear on a click. It's a different style of having a menu. It's sort of like you get in File Explorer. No, not really. I don't think it does. I don't think when Windows Explorer used to be able to do this, where you could expand it. Well, like this, we can click on quick access and show everything underneath there. Yeah, that's that's kind of like what we have here. And we can expand uh, this is yeah, this is what I want. We can expand Windows C drive, we can expand INET pub and go on down the line. Same thing here, except we only have two menus deep. So, how does this work? Think, just imagine how you think this would work. We're probably doing the same old thing of setting the display to block. And then when we click it again, we set it to none. But we do it, we do different things if the, if the link is clicked, whether it's showing or not. If the submenu is showing, we make it appear. If the submenu is not showing, I'm sorry, if the, sub, if the submenu is not showing, we make it appear. If the submenu is showing, we make it disappear. So let's look at the code for that. We have a function. Any of you have done programs programming before? Even in Excel, you might be familiar with functions. A function is simply a way to collect a group of statements and give them a name. Because if you notice this, all of these things work the same. So it would be a shame to have to repeat that code three different times. So instead we put that code in one time and we just call it three different times and we tell it what submenu we want to display as an argument to that function. So on click, we call toggle menu and we tell it to do it to submenu one. Here we do it to submenu two. Here we do it to submenu three. What does that function do? It looks to see if that submenu is visible. If it's visible, it sets it to none. If it's not visible, it sets it to block. Now, why are there not quotes around this? There are no quotes around this because we're not looking for the ID of ARG. We're looking for the value of that variable, which is this value here. So if we click on that, ARG will have the value of submenu one, 
So we will either show or hide some menu one. So notice that the code is pretty clean. All right. There's not three separate of one of these, one for each submenu. There's one that we call a function and tell it which submenu we want to show or hide. I've also incorporated this on a more completed page than we had before. Here's the thing about JavaScript. For this class, I'm just interested in you understanding the basics of what JavaScript can provide a web page. If you don't understand all the examples, by all means, ask me questions. But it's not a problem if you don't understand them all. As long as you can take one of them and adapt it to put it on a, a page and use it, that's what I'm looking at. All right, here's another one. And right now, right away, we can see that it's different because it's based on the mouse over instead of the click. And the other thing is, is it puts uh, a different color on the sub menu. So let's look at that. All right. This one doesn't use a function and notice how there's repetitive code. On mouse over, we change that sub menu to visible and we change the background color of that LI to yellow. When we say this, we mean the thing that that JavaScript is on. So this means this LI. And likewise, we saw before, Oh, the UL is part of the LI. We didn't see this before. So the LI stays visible even if you're hovering over something in the submenu. All right. I have two zoo examples that we'll look at. Zoo one has thumbnails. What's a thumbnail? Thumbnail is a smaller version of an image. So I have each image two ways. I have the full size image and I have the thumbnail. Now notice that these two are oriented or this one and this one are oriented horizontally. This one's oriented vertically. Yet I made the thumbnails. Thumbnail, thumbnail, thumbnail. Oh, never mind. I didn't make the thumbnails the same size. I kind of, well, I made them the same width. I didn't make them the same height. As we put our mouse over the image, it shows the bigger version of that picture. Now we've so far we've changed the CSS. This will be a case where we're actually changing the HTML because we're changing the content of an image tag. So let's look at that. All right. Actually, I did this all with one image. No, I, I didn't do it with one image. I have two images. I have the one T, which is a thumbnail, and I have the big image over here. So I set the thumbnails to all have a width of thumbnail section to have a width of 25%. Each image within that, I give a width of 100%. That's why all these line up 
with the same width because they're all 100% of 20%, 25% of the page. The big picture, I give a, uh, oh, the big picture section, I give a quote, uh, I float it to the left and I give a width of 60% and I make the image inside that 100%. So notice as I make these bigger or smaller, at a certain point it gets smaller. And I also give a maximum uh, width. So in other words, no matter how big that image is, uh, how wide this window is, it never gets bigger than 500. Displaying an image bigger than it actually is will cause uh, pixelization, where as the, the image will look blurry and it won't look good. So what am I doing here on mouse over? I find the thing on the page that has an element. Uh, I find the element on the page that has an ID of big. That's this image tag right here. And what do I change? I change the source attribute source attribute that matches. It's not a coincidence. We're actually manipulating the SRC property of that image. So we're changing just as I had, just as though I went and typed in a new value for that image. So if I'm over thumbnail one, I set it to thumb to big picture one, thumbnail two to big picture two, and so on. This one's a little different. It's based on clicks. Images are all based on percentages, notice, because I make this little window wider. It makes it wider. Let's look at this example, which is I created a change image function. Because if you notice in this code, I have this instruction repeated a bunch of times. What if I wanted to do something else? Like what if I wanted to change the alt attribute? I'd have to add that to every single mouse over event. Here, I just call change image function based on the click and I change the image to the big image one, two, and three and I change the alt attribute for those people with a screen reader to just inform it that, you know, what it's a picture of. So at the very least they know that. And I could be more descriptive if I wanted to. So as I click around, I'm setting Finding the thing on the page that has a uh, ID of big, I'm setting the SRC to image SRC. I'm setting the alt to image alt, the alt attribute. I've also put in an access key. So if you have a carpal tunnel or something like this, I know that can't. Take my word for it. I do have a witness here in class. I'm not using the mouse. I'm only using the keyboard to switch between the images by hitting Alt-1, Alt-2, or Alt-3. If you remember for accessibility, people with certain kinds of, of uh, neurological issues or uh, repetitive uh, stress injury or arthritis sometimes have a harder time using the mouse and the keyboard. Well, this allows them to switch images based on the keyboard, as opposed to using the mouse and having to move the mouse over to do that. That's what this access key means. It means alt, whatever key I pressed. Okay, the last example or examples I wanna go over 
is let's look at our Google search. If you remember, we did this where we typed in something to search for. And we called Google. Or what if you don't put anything to search for? Well, we would want to display an error. In this case, we set the color red and italics. Again, for those people that might be colorblind, they notice something's wrong because it changed from regular font to italics. And then we say must enter something. That's done via JavaScript. And what we do there is I have on submit, that's the user advance. In other words, when the submit button is pressed, call the function validate form and return to the on submit event the result of validate form, which will either be true or false. If this function returns a true, it will continue and submit the form. If this function returns a false, it will stop the form from submitting. What do I mean by return? There's a thing in a function called a return value that the function can only return one of. All right. And in this case, it's going to return a true or false. Yes, the form is valid. No, it isn't. And I look to make sure that the thing on the page with an ID of Q, its value, when I get rid of all the leading and, tra and trailing spaces, it's not an empty string. So in other words, if I try to trick it and put in a bunch of spaces, it also gives me an error. That's what the trim accomplishes. If there is nothing in that field, then I return false. And I set the inner HTML of the air field, air text, to must enter something. And I set the class name for the label. To error. And that error class is defined as being red and italics. Let's look at calc. This calculates the circumference of a circle. I put in the radius, say two, and it tells me the circumference is 1.256. The circumference of the radius is two times radius times pi, I think. Yeah. All right, this has code in to make sure that if we type in something that's not a number or type nothing, it gives us an error. But if we type in something that's valid, it does the calculation. How does it do that? Well, same thing. Instead of a submit, because we don't want to send the data to a web server, we just have a plain old button. And when we click it, it calls calculate. First thing calculate does is grabs the value of the radius from the thing on the screen that has an ID of radius. Is NAN means we're asking if that's not a number or is it empty? So if it's not a number or is empty, we display this error. Otherwise, the circumference is two pi r and we then set the results by addressing the inner HTML. If you didn't get one of these, don't worry about it. 
By all means, ask if you want to, though. But you don't have to master all of these for the assignment. For the assignment, you just need to incorporate some JavaScript into it. So if you do an image swap, that counts. If you do something where you put your mouse over something and something appears, that counts. I want to show a couple of other things real quick. Here's a more detailed example of JavaScript validation. You can look at. And here is something that is sort of becoming deprecated, or I mean, it may have already be, it may already be deprecated. Deprecated means obsolete, but I did keep it in because it is kind of cool. jQuery UI, which is a way to use jQuery, which is a JavaScript library to do some cool UI things. So, for example, you could create an accordion widget on your page. What do I mean by accordion? Let's say you have four sections. You could click the section title and display only a piece of it at a time. And here's a code to do that. Not very extensive code because we are using a little bit of JavaScript. I don't know if I mentioned it, but if we have JavaScript that's that is in the head section, it should be in the script tag. Whereas if we have JavaScript on an HTML tag, it will be on the event. And it uses these JavaScript libraries, jQuery and jQuery UI. But this is a nice way to get a little bit of interactivity in your page without having to know a lot of details about JavaScript. So, you're encouraged to try this if you want. Okay, just to review, no lecture next Monday, extended office hours next week, and I will post information about them as well as important information about the end of the semester. I'll post that sometime this week, so be on the lookout for it. Uh, I strongly urge for you to either email me or show up during office hours to let me see your project before you turn it in so that we can iron out any misunderstandings or uh, drawbacks in your project before you turn it in, should be able to get full credit on it. All right, that's all I had. Uh, I've enjoyed the semester. Uh, take care. <laughs>